everything that exists. And it includes molecules, planets, billiard balls, people, but it also includes data in computers, laws, plans, timetables, schedules, ideas, thoughts, theories, and so on. So it really is everything. Level two is what goes on inside your head. Or inside a scientist's head, or inside a bird's head when the bird perceives a tree. So level two is the interior part of everything. So level two is a proper part of level one, because what goes on inside your head truly does exist, so it's part of everything. But it has a special status, and its special status turns on the fact that it's ideas and thoughts and beliefs and perceptions in people's heads which give us access to targets of mental experience. Level three is another part of what exists, and it consists of what is publicly available from level two. So when I write down my thoughts, or when I create an ontology, or when I, um, uh, when someone else creates a scientific theory, then we start off with ideas in our respective heads, but we move to something which is documented, which is written down, which is observable by others and shareable by others. So that's level three. So examples of level one would be something that happened. An example from level two would be an interpretation of that something, which we call something number 120, because we give numbers to things. It's an interpretation of that something that it is a security breach. That's somebody's idea. Some analyst in a room sees an incident and interprets it as a security breach. And then level, third, uh, level two um, is illustrated also by an expectation that something will happen. Level three is an entry in a, an information system or in a logbook or in a diary about, about number 120 uh, expressing what some cognitive agent believed about number 120. So the only question now is, is the distinction between level one, level two, and level three clear to everybody? It's not meant to be rocket science. It's meant to be very simple. Now, ontologies exist on level three. And ontologies can be about anything. So the ontologies have as their domain the entirety of level one. And they gain information about level one through observations in level two. But level two is really uh, just a stepping stone. What we're really interested in are the ontologies in level three and the entities, the things, the events, the processes which happen at level one. All right. So. Another issue which I introduced a week ago is uh, how do we know which terms in ontologies designate universal? So universal, you remember, is just another word for type or kind or general repeatable structure in reality. Ontologies contain general terms which are about universals. And examples of universals are organism, cell, chair, table, motor car, electron, and so on. And Roughly speaking, this is not. This is just a rule of thumb. It's not a hard and fast rule. The entities in the, the terms which denote universals are the sorts of terms which can be used by scientists when formulating their theories. And there are scientists who formulate theories about motor cars. There are scientists who formulate theories about cells and electrons. And so these are good candidates for being terms which represent universals. Your ontology, when it's populated, will consist of mainly of terms representing universals, plus a few specialized terms which you need for your specific case study. So for instance, let's suppose you're interested in diabetes. The term diabetes is, is a term which designates a universe. Let's suppose you're interested in diabetes in Buffalo. Then you might introduce into your ontology a term called diabetes in Buffalo which doesn't represent a universal, because diabetes is the universal term. Diabetes in Buffalo represents a subset 
of all the entities in reality which instantiate the universal diabetes. Now that subset is called a class. A class is a maximal collection of particulars designated or determined by a general term. So the universal cell has particulars called cells which instantiate. The class of all cells is what is referred to here. The, the collection of all particulars of X for which X is a cell is true. The class of all patients with diabetes, similarly, is the collection of all particulars for which X is a patient with diabetes is true. All right. Now, universals have extensions. The classes or collections of particulars are the extensions of universals. The extension of the universal A is just the class which consists of all the particulars for which X is A is true. So there's nothing special about extensions. They're just maximal classes determined by universals. Now there's a problem here. Very often we use the same general term to refer in some contexts to a universal and in other contexts to refer to a class. Now that, that is a very important distinction to be clear about, and it's particularly important when it comes to issues connected with OWL, because OWL in and of itself does not make a, a draw any kind of um, line between these two, because OWL is not an ontology, it's a language, and you can formulate in OWL ontologies which make a clear distinction between universals and classes. But not everyone who uses OWL uses it to make that distinction. Many people who use OWL use it in such a way that there is no distinction. But for us, for all the work we do, it's absolutely crucial that you recognize the distinction between two uses of general terms. One use is illustrated by HIV is an infectious retrovirus, or by cat is a mammal, or by... Um, Toothache is a pain, and the other one is represented by the second uh, sentence here, HIV is spreading very rapidly through Asia. That's not about the universal, that's about the class of the instances of the universal, it's about the extension. And similarly, toothache is spreading through buffalo, uh, cats are spreading through um, uh, batavia. Um, in each case, we can make a distinction between a sentence asserting something about the universal and a sentence asserting something about the extension of the universal. So we have universals. Some univer so universals have extensions. Some classes are extensions of universals, but some classes are not extensions of universals. Diabetes patient in Buffalo is an example of a class which is out there on the right-hand end. It's called a defined class. Uh, you can think of defined as being contrasted with natural. The extensions of universals are natural classes, but natural is not a very clearly definable term. So we don't need to, uh, to understand what we're going to call the things on the left. You can call them extensions if you want. The things on the right are, are defined classes which include, for instance, populations, the population of patients in Buffalo with diabetes. Um, now, there are classes um, well, this is in Leipzig. There are classes, therefore, which are defined by general terms, which do not designate universals. There are classes which are defined by general terms, which do designate universals, and the latter are called the extensions of the universals. Now, other examples of defined classes are fin sibling of Finnish spies. So there is no universal consisting of all the siblings of Finnish spies, or member of ABBA aged greater than 50 years. This is another example of a defined class. Now, they are clearly not representing universals. They, they, they are obvious. I hope it's clear anyway. So cell and electron are clear examples of terms which do represent universals. Sibling of a Finnish spy is an example of a clear case of a term which does not represent universals. In the middle, we have some problem cases. So girl, for instance, is that 
a term which represents the universe, or does it represent the defined class, human being who is female and younger than 17, 19? Actually, I think it does def def the, the, represent a defined class, and I think I can give you arguments for that, but it's a borderline case. Another example would be pet. I think pet is a defined class. It's certainly not the sort of term which normal biology scientists would use to formulate scientific laws. Somebody who's interested in domestic uh, arrangements of uh, people in, in uh, societies might very well use the term pet as a scientific term. So it's another borderline case. Now, fortunately, these borderline cases never cause problems. Uh, providing you're careful that you define the terms you use, whether they refer to universals or to uh, classes, is not going to cause you any problems. And it's, you certainly won't lose marks when you get graded for putting a term under the universal head or under the defined class head, unless you do that in a way which is obviously confused. Providing it's just the occasional term which is moved on one side or the other, nothing can go wrong. The, where, where we need to start worrying about where terms go is when you have an ontology which is used by many people, and then you have other ontologies which are in the neighbor, neighborhood of that ontology. Then you may want to come to agreements about those borderline cases. But if you're just producing an ontology for yourself, it's not too crucial. Good. So if you're building an ontology for yourself, as it were, or for a local group, you could choose a certain usage of girl, or you could have two words, girl one and girl two, which you, one of which could be a defined class, one of which could be a universal. So from that point of view, there is no right or wrong. But then when you've finished your ontology, you want to show it to other people, everyone that you uh, come into contact with who also has an ontology might have arguments or might, might have strong feelings about what the term girl should properly mean. And then you would have to negotiate. And sometimes there are negotiations between different groups. Um, and th that's not a bad thing because that's one of the places where scientific progress takes place. Scientists have always had negotiations about proper terminology. Any more questions? All right. So just for the sake of completeness, a terminology is a representational artifact whose representational units are natural language terms which are intended to designate universals together with some defined classes. We've already seen this definition, but I'm just repeating it here. Now there is a third dimension which is called concepts, which are this is a term which is variously used in the ontology community. I never use this term. I strongly recommend that you never use this term unless you are doing an ontology for the study of uh, conceptual thinking or use of conceptual language. So language involves lots of uses of general terms and very often linguistics, linguists use the term concept to refer to the meanings of general terms. That's fine. The problem is that in ontology, people use the word concept in all kinds of confused ways. And the best strategy to avoid confusion is just not to use the word and to embarrass the people who do use it. So, concepts uh, are a much larger class. I mean, if there were any. The way concept is used is much larger than the, the, the way defined class is used, which is much larger than the way universals are, are used. And when I say larger, I mean larger in scope. So there are concepts, according to the views of uh, the people I'm now thinking of, which do not correspond even to defined classes. An example would be a congenital absent nipple. So that is a general term, congenital absent nipple. It's used. In medicine, it's, it's, it has a scientific use. We all understand what it means. And so you could say, well, it corresponds to a concept. I would say that if you want to say something like that, then you need to give me a definition of what you mean by concept. 
and then it would be fine. But typically, they do not give you a definition of con what they mean by concept, or they give confused definitions. Um, so remember that we are trying to build ontologies for a representation of things which exist. There are no congenital absent nipples. And the, an absent nipple is a missile nipple. If there is no nipple. What you should say is, instead of this congenital absent nipple is such and such, you should say, people were expecting to see a nipple here, but there was no nipple. Something like that. For, for genetic reasons. So, talking about congenital absent nipples is a way of talking in abbreviated form about something else. And similarly, talking about cancelled performances or about um, surgical procedures not carried out. These are all ways of talking in abbreviations about plans or expectations or people's knowledge or, or a similar phenomena. So a scientific ontology is an ontology, which we just defined, which represents universals in reality and those relations between these universals which obtain universally. And they, they, so far we have two very simple kinds of relations, namely subtype relations. Lung is our anatomical structure and part of relations. All right, now we get back to how to build an ontology. Now, we're going to try some experiments in the course of this semester where you will actually break out into groups and start building an ontology. And if, if you should be, I don't know whether you'll be doing something like that within the labs. So when I say building, I mean getting pieces of paper with words written on them and putting these paper on pieces of paper on the floor and arranging them in hierarchies. And then other people will say, well, this hierarchy should look like this and you're missing a term here. So you get more paper, tear it into little strips and write more words. And then you'll take a, a photograph of what you get projected on the screen. That will be your first ontology. So this is a recipe for building ontologies, which is a, a, a rough and ready approximation to what I just said. So work with scientists to create an initial top level classification. That, that means work with textbooks if you, if you wish, or it works with expert human beings that you can talk to. What you're looking for are the most commonly used terms corresponding to the universals in the relevant domain. And if the domain is lathe, uh, machine shop lathe, then one of the terms will be lathe, for instance. Um, arrange these terms into an informal is a hierarchy. And the, the principle is this. A goes underneath B in the hierarchy only if every instance of A must be an instance of B. So if a lathe is a tool, then every instance of lathe is an instance of tool. There are no exceptions to that rule. Now, there is some... Um, no, there are no exceptions to that rule. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even allow exceptions. Um, and then, once you have the hierarchy, you will find that there are gaps. For instance, you will find that there are other... If you have tool, then lathe then there are other tools which you need to have in your ontology if you're going to do, deal with lathe tools in a coherent way. Or there are other pieces of equipment, such as a bench, for instance. And so you will find gaps. You add terms to fill those gaps, and maybe then you'll need to add more t terms higher up to create links in the appropriate is a hierarchy. And remember, the is a hierarchy is going to have BFO at the very top. All right, now, this is the first step. This is only going to give you the top level. When you come down to the lower levels, then you, you work even more with domain experts who know about the different types of lathes or about the different kinds of processes which lathes are meant to perform or about the different functions of a lathe. Um, so the, this is just the beginning. This is just the top. For the purposes of this course, I would want to see a top and at least some population of some branch within the lower levels of the ontology. Um, now, I, I, did I talk about the principle of low-hanging fruit? So this, this is just a principle that 
for in an ontology, even very trivial things still need to go into the ontology. And you should do those first. And you shouldn't be afraid to do very many of them because that's the way an ontology gets its structure by being populated by very simple um, edges within the ontology graph. Now we talked about this already. Um, each term in the ontology represents one universal, or it represents a collective, a defined class of some sort. Exactly one universal. So one of the reasons why pet is probably not a good term is because it seems to designate multiple universals. Because there are cats which are pets, dogs which are pets, snakes which are pets, and so on. Now, the, the, this is... Perhaps um, so there are no people here who come from the database computer science. Or do we have any computer science people in the room? Okay. In the computer science database world, there is a habit which, from my point of view, looks like a confusion. Not everyone who has this habit is confused, but it looks like a confusion. And the habit is to define a model of reality and to use the very same words for the entities within the model as you use for the reality which you're trying to model. So you will say things like rabbit represents rabbit. What you should say is the rabbit node within your model represents rabbits in the world, but they don't say that. They, they, this is a, a, a modeling uh, procedure which as I say, is, is not dangerous when it's handled properly, but it is dangerous if it's in the wrong hands. Now, the use mentioned confusion is illustrated by sentences like this. It is true that swimming is healthy. It's not true that swimming has eight letters. What is true is that swimming, in quotes, which is the name of swimming, has eight letters. But people who, use, who, who make the use mentioned confusion think that that, in principle anyway, could be true. They would never say that because they don't usually put the two kinds of assertions together. But other people and computers, above all, can infer that from what they do say. All right, now, uh, uh, the, the use mentioned confusion is a, a confusion between words and things. Swimming is healthy. That means swimming, the thing, the entity is healthy. Swimming has eight letters. That's the word. And there is a general principle that you should avoid confusing words and things in everything that you do. And you should avoid confusing wor words and things on the one hand, which are level three entities and level one entities, with level two entities, which are concepts. So this is, this is really a recommendation to keep levels one, two, and three clearly uh, in your mind when building your ontology. Now, this again, this probably is not going to be a problem that you will face, but in the, old, the olden days, um, ontology started out in, in, in many cases as being artifacts created by library science. So the library scientists who were cataloging the books in the library or the articles in the... Uh, uh, PubMed database. Um, they were the people who were building what became ontologies. And they characteristically would conceive what they were doing as building collections of descriptors for describing things in books or for things in libraries or for things in databases. And so they had things like diabetes is a mesh descriptor. So the topmost term in the MeSH medical subject headings uh, catalog of terms is MeSH descriptor. Everything is a child of MeSH descriptor. So Germany is a MeSH descriptor. Um, disease is a MeSH descriptor. In SNOMED, the systematized nomenclature for medicine, the topmost term is concept. So for SNOMED, diabetes is a concept. Now, you can see that there is some confusion there. Diabetes is not a concept. The idea of diabetes in somebody's head 
might be a concept. The meaning of the term diabetes might be a concept, but diabetes itself is a disease, and no disease is a concept. Now, that is an example of a very, very well uh, disseminated, um, very large medical vocabulary which makes the use mention confusion from the very top. Now, gradually, they're learning how to avoid the confusion. But still, the topmost node of SNOMED is, is still constant. Um, now, another issue we've, we've already addressed briefly uh, is the following. So, couldn't some people use the word girl to mean one thing? Other people use the word girl to mean another thing. Couldn't some people use the word cell to mean a unit of biological organization? Where other people use the word cell to mean place inside a prison or a room inside a prison which is locked. Um, clearly, we have a problem here. The very same words are used in different ways by different communities. Now, there's no way in which we can have absolute univocity of word. Univocity means unique use or unique meaning because there are too many words like cell or bank or... Um, uh, um, desktop, which have already well-established uses. However, if we're dealing with biology, then we probably should, and if we know that we're going to be dealing with different parts of biology in our ontology work, then we should probably try to avoid using biological terms to mean different things in our ontology from what they mean in everybody else's ontology. Now, everybody else in ontology uses the word cell to mean a unit of, or a unit of structure in the organization of life, which can apply both to plants and to animals. And so it was a mistake when the plant cell, or, sorry, the plant ontology used the word cell to just mean plant cells. Because plant cells uh, are, engage in interactions with other kinds of cells, for instance, with saliva cells when we chew plants. And we may want to do science about the interactions between saliva, not saliva cells, uh, between uh, mouth cells um, and plant cells when we chew plant cells. But we can't do that if the word cell is used by the plant ontology to mean plant cell, because then we have no word for cells in the mouse. Now they changed, I made them change their definition so that cell in the plant cell now means cell and the word for plant cell in the plant ontology is plant cell. That is a very good rule for an ontology. In every well-built ontology, every expression E with quotes means E without quotes. Now, it sounds trivial, but I can give you a thousand examples of ontologies where people did not follow that rule. And they're all bad ontologies. So, when, if you want to say something about X's in your ontology, include the term X in your ontology. Supply definitions, that's another principle. And in fact, when you, before you're done, you will need to supply two kinds of definitions, namely human readable definitions and logical definitions in OWL. And um, th there should be exactly one definition, but you can have then these two different versions, one for human beings, and one for computers. Um, so shall we have a brief pause for questions. So the, the next problem is um, with problem of circularity. So definition should not be circular. Uh, I, there, are, there, there are actually existing medical terminologies which define as a person like that. Um, and the, this, you can see that this is a problem, first of all, because it doesn't give you any information about what the word person means. And a good definition should give you information about what the term being defined means. It's also a problem because it's, it's clear that there are persons who are persons, even though they don't have identity documents. Um, now, this, this is a, um, 
another example of a certain uh, of, of a circular definition. Uh, and the problem here is that the um, this is the old version of the plant ontology, where they thought that because they were only interested in plants, it was perfectly good to deal with only plant cells. So they used the term cell to mean only plant cells, and then they ended up with definitions like that, which no one else should could accept, because it's just not true that every cell is a plant cell. And a definition is a statement about every case of the defined term. It says that every case of the defined term satisfies all the conditions on the right, and everything which satisfies all the conditions on the right is an instance of the defined term. So this is more than just circular. This is actually, it, 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 it fails to satisfy a very important principle, which is that every definition should be true in, in, in a way that everyone working in any discipline can see to be the case. And here, anybody who works in biology can see that this is not true. All right. So avoid circular definitions. Now, that, that means don't define a term using that term itself or some close equivalent term. Uh, because the whole point of defining terms is to help people understand their meanings. And so you define a term by explaining what it means in simpler terms that are more commonly understood. Now, I'll just mention, not every term can be defined. Some terms are primitive. They're so simple, so commonly understood, that nothing could be more simple. So definitions have to stop somewhere. And BFO, broadly speaking, is where it stops. So many of the terms in BFO are not really definable. They are, they, you can elucidate them, but you can't define them. How do you formulate definitions? Aristotle defined a man as a rational animal. Now that is the standard for definitions. He meant by man uh, homo sapiens, instance of homo sapiens. So for him, uh, every homo sapiens is an animal, and every homo sapiens is rational, and everything which is both a rational, which is both rational and an animal, is a, is an instance of Homo sapiens. And that's useful um, in many ways to force every definition to be of this form. So you define A's as B's which C, where B is the immediate parent term of A, and C is that which tells you what those Bs have in common, which are A's, and which distinguishes them from those Bs which are not A's. So the C is the differentia, it's the characteristic which differentiates the A's from the other Bs. There are lots of Bs, some of the Bs are A's, the ones which are A's all have C. So A's are Bs which C. Now that is useful first because it tells you how to write a definition, you know where to start. You start just by looking at the immediate parent in your ontology. That tells you that there should only be one immediate parent. If you have two parents, you won't know which one to use for the definition. But it's useful also because everyone can follow this rule in the same way, and so you will get a certain convergence of definitions. It, it's useful because the ontologies will then converge. You can add ontology branches into other ontologies because you know that this rule is being followed. It's also useful because it gives you a check on the correctness of your hierarchy. So defining the terms that that job is half done just by creating the is a hierarchy. Um, now I said this, don't seek to define everything because some terms are primitive, they can't be defined. Example would be identity or instance. Now, here are some rules for formulating terms. So, we're not here building databases. When we don't care how long terms are because we're not trying to fit everything on a single screen. So, terms can be rather long. They should always be singular nouns or noun phrases. I think I said that last week. That, that you shouldn't use abbreviations unless they're completely well known and it would be... Uh, problematic for you not to use an abbreviation. You should certainly avoid acronyms 
again, except in very well-known cases such as DNA. Um, you should avoid mass nouns, and we talked about that last week. You should always use count nouns. And if you need a count noun, then use a, a, a phrase like portion of, portion of sugar, portion of tissue. And every term in the ontology has to be a singular noun or a singular noun phrase because every term in the ontology is referring to some general entity, some one general entity, either a universal or a defined class. So you, you should always make sure that it looks like a term that is referring to one entity, and that means a noun. Now, there is an exception uh, in chemistry. Chem chem chemistry ontologies very often have two terms, amino acid, which is the term for the universal amino acid, and amino acids, which is a term referring to a family of things that chemists like to talk about. And there are, there are dozens of such terms in chemistry. And there's just no way around it. You have to follow the consensus practice. You're going to get adoption of your ontology. All right, university, we meant university. Shirt terms should have the same meanings on every occasion of use. So cell should always be cell. It shouldn't mean, it shouldn't mean plant cell when you happen to be working with plant scientists. And universality, all relations asserted in the ontology should hold universally. That one does not hold universally. It's not true that every pneumococcal virus causes pneumonia. There are many, many pneumococcal viruses that never cause any pneumonia because they never are inside a host. The, if you do it the other way around, pneumonia caused by a pneumococcal virus, that is universal. All right, and what this means is that the order will often matter. matter. So transformation of means to be changed into. Every adult is the transformation of some child. That's universal. You can't be an adult without having once been a child. But it's not true that every child transforms into an adult because some children never become adults because they get run over by a bus or they otherwise die before they reach the stage of adulthood. So, um, Protocol design earlier than results analysis. If you're going to have results in an experiment, you have to design your protocol and run the experiment first. But it doesn't follow from that that the results analysis is later than the protocol design. Now, this is supposed to be somewhat counterintuitive. Surely, if A is later than, if earlier than B, then B is later than A. But that's not true. And that you should understand that because this tells you something about what it is to reason with ontologies. Reasoning with ontologies is always an all-sum business. All protocol designs are earlier than... Um, Actually, I don't mean that. That's wrong. I think it... So if we're talking about experimental results, then it's true. Every result analysis is later than some protocol design, because you can't run an experiment without a protocol design. It's not true that every protocol design is earlier than some results analysis, because there's lots of protocols which are designed but never run. So you see how hard ontology is, even when you're talking about absolute trivialities. All right. Um, now I said it was a bad thing to have terms in an ontology which begin with non. Negative terms should be avoided. Um, so there are no such universals as non-mammal or non-membrane or other metal worker in New Zealand, although there are many terms like other metal worker in New Zealand in SNOMED, or there used to be. I haven't checked lately. Uh, that, that's just bad design. Now, one of the reasons why it's bad design is because if you say non-X, then it's not clear whether you really mean thing which is not X or something else. And to give you an example, 
If you use non-smoker, then you don't mean thing which does not smoke. What you mean is human who does not smoke. Because a chair is a thing which does not smoke. A cardinal number is a thing which does not smoke. A building is a thing which does not smoke. But it's not, none of those things is a non-smoker. So again, the, the general rule is avoid negative terms when building ontologies. Um, now, there is an issue with non-smokers. Suppose you're doing an experiment on non-smokers in Buffalo to see whether they have higher levels of something or other. Then you may use, you may need to use a term like non-smoker, and then you should define it very carefully. Uh, and not think of it as logically negative. It's, it's, it's a positive term. It's a special kind of human being, namely those kinds of human beings who uh, don't, and then you have to formulate some threshold because if you smoke once in your life, you're still a non-smoker. If you smoke once a year, you're still a non-smoker. But if you smoke 15 cigarettes a day and have been doing for some time, then you are a, not a non-smoker. And each protocol Will, which is about non-smoking or smoking behavior, will define what they mean by smoking behavior, if they're doing their job properly, at least. So, objectivity. The universals in ontologies are not a function of our knowledge, they're a function of reality. And that's true even if we don't know much about the relevant reality. So, there are no such things as unknown ligands, or unclassified items in the catalog, or unlocalized pigeons. Uh, that Those terms are abbreviations, bad abbreviations, for statements about what we know. Um, now, it's very common in medical classifications to try and build terms which doctors will use who are afraid of issues of liability. So they're, they're, they use terms like probable diabetes because then they, they can argue that they never made a diagnosis of diabetes. Now, those kinds of terms are perfectly good for medical terminologies, but they're not good for ontologies. The ontology terms to capture that kind of uncertainty of diagnosis are terms belonging to an epistemological ontology, an ontology about evidence, or an ontology about different kinds of strength of assertion but not about an ontology of different kinds of strength of a diabetes. There's no such thing as diabetes diagnosed on a Wednesday. Similarly, there's no such thing as diabetes diagnosed with an uncertainty factor of weak. What you have is a diagnosis which occurred on a Wednesday, and you have a diagnosis which occurred with an uncertainty factor of weak. All right. Um, so... Keep knowledge and ontology separate. Don't have any unknown things in your ontology. Um, and another aspect of this is try not to put a whole sentence worth of information into an ontology term. So just because you surmise that this is a case of pneumonia does not mean that there are special kinds of cases of pneumonia called surmised pneumonias. That's a mistake. Uh, so single inheritance we've talked about, it's a source of errors, it encourages laziness, but you should use it, you should expect it if you're using defined classes. So it, single inheritance is ruled out only where we're talking about universals. And then is overloading, you will find that very often, particularly in older ontologies, they confuse is a with instance of. John is a man, man is a mammal. The, the, the two words, isa, are the, the words that are used when speaking English, but when speaking ontology, you need to distinguish John, instance of man. Man is a mammal, in the sense of is a, meaning subtype. All right, we saw that a week ago. So we deal with roles or qualities. We build an ontology of roles, and then we can avoid multiple inheritances. Now, I, if you look at cartoons in science texts, or if you look at maps, you will find they have legends. Here the legend is captured by means of 
words around the cartoon and arrows pointing to the corresponding part of the uh, entity in question. Now, I think that these legends are ontologies. I think that, in fact, to see an ontology as a legend for a cartoon or as a legend for a map or as an, a legend for a database where you have all the different kinds of rock represented on the map using different colors, the legend for those colors is an ontology. And it will very often be organized in a, in a little hierarchy. So igneous, igneous rocks and so on. Then you have the seven different kinds of igneous rocks which are indented. But now, if you think about it, cartoons always show entities of a certain size and label them. They don't show entities of a lesser size. So there are no molecules on this picture. You could have a diagram or a cartoon of molecules within some cell component. But here, there are no molecules. Now, this is called granularity. The granularity of this cartoon is higher or coarser than the granularity of a molecule representation. Every ontology will have a certain granularity. This is partly because every ontology will have a certain level of detail beneath which it doesn't go, because people just give up or they, they wait. But it's partly because the ontology will be built for a certain purpose, and that purpose is addressed by people using instruments of a certain sort, which can only see down to a certain granularity or resolution. So ontologies, and this is true of maps, it's true of cartoons, it's true of diagrams, it's true of databases, they always come with a certain granularity threshold. Now, this doesn't mean that they are false. This is a true cartoon. Just because it doesn't show molecules doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it has a level of granularity. Just because you have a map of the Earth which shows the Earth as flat doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that you have a certain projection. And anyone who understands maps knows what that projection involves. So ontologies can be true even though they're only partial. Ontologies can be true even though they only go down to a certain level of detail. And this is... Um, this is, on the one hand, very uh, reassuring because it means that we don't need to spend the rest of our lives cataloging all the molecules in every uh, component of, of cells. But on the other hand, it means that our ontology of cells at this level of granularity, the ontology of cell components, has to work well with ontologies lower down in the granular hierarchy, for instance, with protein ontologies, which are about molecules. So we, we have to be aware that other people will have to use our ontology to go to the next level down in the granularity hierarchy.